it's a really weird phase, but we've documented now 24 bucks total in the last three years on six different pieces of property that have what we call field trips the last week of July, first week of August, onto the property. They show up for a day, maybe two, and then they're gone again, and we don't pick them back up until the rut. And the bucks that we've had on those properties that we follow all summer and they leave that week, those bucks leave that farm as soon as they go harvesting. Mm. So I never get another picture of them until late season when they've either shed or about to shed. So we kind of picked that up. So I always tell guys, like, biggest thing for the most important week to have your trail cameras out is always the last week of July because you're going to pick up some new deer that you're never going to see, but you're going to pick up the deer you're going to hunt during the rut. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 282. Blake Garrett, Big Buck Field Trips. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Rackology. Everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts. Or online at www.rackology.org. Minus 33 Merino Wool Layering System. Timeless natural insulation keeping you warm on the coldest days while staying breathable and wicking away moisture on the wet ones without the old school itch of regular wool. Grizzly Ears, the most advanced engineered wireless earbuds for the outdoors. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Quiet Cat, the all-terrain electric bicycle. Visit quietcat.com, that's Q-U-I-E-T-K-A-T.com, and use the discount code Big Buck 1-5 to secure 15% off your next Quiet Cat purchase. And Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies. And show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Art Helen from Art Helen Outdoors, Nigel, Wisconsin. Get ready to listen to another amazing interview with Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Cameron Cobble, the Average Joe Blue Collar Bow Hunter, and you're listening to my number one favorite podcast of all time, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Eva Shockey. You're about to listen to another great episode of Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. Blake Garrett knows a thing or two about deer hunting because he's seen a thing or two about deer behavior. Blake takes his approach to deer hunting with scientific overtones. Studying big buck behavior over several years using game cameras and observation, he's noticed some interesting patterning year to year enough to develop and scientifically test his theories. Blake is big into positive deer reinforcement when it comes to deer hunter habits and endlessly avoids negative deer encounter events. Blake discusses with us in detail his deer hunting approach, habits, and theories. We'll get to our entire interview with Blake Garrett in just one moment, but before we do, let's hear from our friends at Rackology, Minus 33 Merino Wool Products, and Jim Keller with the Deer News. (laughs) 
Hey, it's Eric Fitzgerald here with Rackology. Wanted to visit you briefly about one of the most exciting products that we got in the market with Rackology. This is our food plot fertilizer. You can supplement your deer right through your food plot with this product. This is not your normal NPK. This has got so many goodies in this bag. Basically what it does is it makes your soil work for you so you can get by with just using fertilizer like this and not a lot of synthetics. If you want a good food plot and you want deer coming in and healthy, healthy plants, look at the food plot fertilizer through Rackology. Check us out at rackology.org. Thanks for tuning in. Let's talk about a hunter's layering system for a sec. We need to be ready for any weather that Mother Nature throws at us. With the layering concepts that Minus 33 has created with their incredible Merino wool products, they've got you covered. The Minus 33's Merino wool expedition weight garments will keep you warm on the coldest late season days while regulating and wicking away moisture in a way that only Merino wool can do. You see, wool will absorb up to 30% of its weight and moisture without leaving you feeling wet or clammy, and wool insulates better than cotton or polyester and protects against hypothermia on those late season hunts. And here's another interesting point. You might not think of wool for early season, but with the Minus 33 wicking technology, I'll take a lightweight Minus 33 base layer any day in warm weather. Merino wool fibers naturally reject any bacteria found in moisture or sweat and gives you double protection against odor as your target buck approaches. Visit www.minus33.com to learn more about Minus 33's layering technology. Use the code BIGBUCK33 to get 10% off your next order. Now here's Jim Keller with the deer news. Our first story this week, no deer season in part of Mississippi, it's possible. This story is from the Clarion Ledger website and was reported by Brian Broom. Mississippi's South Delta has been flooded for most of the year and that has taken its toll on wildlife. Pictures of dead and emaciated deer have been seen untold times on social media and people are concerned about the condition and size of the herd. In response, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks is polling hunters who hunt the area and options in the poll about the coming deer season range from no change in the season to no season at all. No season at all would take a majority vote. Harvest and mortality data as well as camera surveys will also be taken into consideration. Reactions to the situations are mixed. J.T. Baum of Pascagoula said he'd prefer the season be closed entirely in the South Delta. Others commented on social media and preferences range from shortening the season to closing or shortening the season in the worst affected areas. Four-year-old girl among five campers attacked by bobcat. This story was reported by ABC News. Five family members were injured by a bobcat at their campsite in Arizona, according to authorities. The victims, all Arizona residents, were at the Shannon Campgrounds in Mount Graham when a bobcat entered their campsite around 7.30 p.m. Sunday, according to news release from the Graham County Sheriff's Office. The bobcat first attacked a four-year-old girl, prompting other family members to hit, kick, and grab the animal to get it off her. One of the family members, Tyler Ray, 34, told deputies that at one point he was rolling on the ground with the bobcat, according to the release. Another witness said the bobcat lunged at her after it was separated from the child, according to authorities. The big cat eventually ran off, but the five victims, aged 4 to 63, sustained bite marks, scratches, and cuts to the hands, thighs, faces, and heads. After they were checked out by paramedics on the scene, they drove themselves to the hospital. The Arizona Game and Fish Department has been notified of the attack and will continue the investigation. It is unclear whether the bobcat has been located. Uncharted viewers are furious about Gordon Ramsay shooting a goat. This story is from the MSN Lifestyle website and was reported by Greg Morabito. Human exclamation point Gordon Ramsay is drawing ire from viewers of his new National Geographic series, Uncharted, over a scene where the chef shoots and kills a goat. The scene in question takes place on a hillside in rural New Zealand where Ramsay and a local hunter named Dan Russell go out in search of some protein for a feast that the host is preparing with chef Monique Fiso. Introduced to New Zealand in the 18th century, goats are an invasive species with no natural predators. They've caused untold damage to native vegetation, Ramsey explains via narration. As they approach a crest where goats are grazing, Russell tells Ramsey that they're considered a real pest by the locals and that 15 years ago they were out of control. Once they spot a big goat across the hillside, Ramsey kneels down and makes his shot. The scene includes no guts, no blood, or footage of the animal suffering. Ramsey is also so far away from the goat that he and Russell have to actually hike across the hillside to go and retrieve their kill. 
and the next time the goat appears, it's already been broken down into a tidy little cuts of meat for the feast, like you might find at a boutique butcher shop. As far as animal killing scenes go, this one is completely sanitized, but that didn't stop viewers from taking Twitter to complain about Gordon killing the cute animal with his gun. Especially considering that so many hours of food TV are devoted to cooking and eating dead animals, and the fact that Ramsey was accompanied by a local hunter who explained the community's relationship to the wildlife. The anger over this scene seems a bit misplaced. Neither Ramsey nor National Geographic have addressed the backlash yet, and they probably won't, especially since Uncharted, by the way, has already been greenlit for a second season. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum and John Geis for leads on stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Blake Garrett. Blake Garrett, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm good, man. How are you? doing well brother it's deer season's right around the corner and that the, you know how that that the, there's like a change as soon as august gets here the 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 nighttime temperatures start to drop so that those early mornings start to feel more like deer early deer season every day you get that feeling oh yeah oh yeah for sure that, that's kind of to me that's when not the deer season ever stops but that's when i start to get like really excited yeah. Oh, yeah. You start to kind of feel it down there. It's absolutely true. Yep. Where are you at, Blake? So I'm in central Missouri, just almost, I mean, smack dab in the middle of the state. You know, I-70 went through uh, Missouri right in the middle, and I'm pretty much halfway between um, St. Louis and Kansas City, just right in the middle. Okay. All right. Why do you call that home? <laughs> it's, it's where I grew up. I grew up in a little bit town called Marshall, Missouri. That's probably, I, I say a little bit. It's a town about 12,000. And, uh, kind of, you know, grew up there, started hunting there, kind of cut my teeth hunting there. Um, and then uh, just the way things go, I met my wife, who was uh, going to law school at NU at the University of Missouri. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just settled down after she graduated there, and got, she got a job here, so that's where we are in, in Columbia. It's really nice for me and what I do, because it's so centrally located that uh, I'm really, you know, eight hours from just about any kind of hunting I want to do, whether I want to go east or west or north or south, or you know, this is really, really convenient for me. Gotcha. So you're you're centrally located, and that that definitely helps you get to different parts of Missouri. Do you hunt Missouri most of the time? Is like that the place that you focus on? No, actually, where I spend, I'll say the majority of my time as far as all season goes. Obviously, because I live here and. And I've got a bunch of farms that we manage down here. And, uh, you know, it's kind of where I get to do, you know, trail cameras for me is, is huge. I, I love running trail cameras. It's probably one of the favorite things I do in the off season. And um, so it's a time for me to get out there and, and do that supplemental feed program. All that stuff is done in Missouri for the most part. But when the fall comes, I spend a lot of probably close to two months. Um, all of September usually, and then half of October, um, I'll be gone. I'll be on the road. I'll be out west typically, um, doing hunts out there, and then I come back home for the rut in Missouri. And then late season comes around, and I'll either, if I've if I filled my out of state tags, and I'll stay home um, and late season hunt. But if I haven't, then I go back on the road and try to get um, you know those out of state tags filled. But I'd say, you know, for the hunt, in the hunting time of the world, in the hunting time of the year, I'm, gosh, I'm gone just as much as I'm here. You know, it's almost 50 50. Gotcha. For the most part. Gotcha. What are your favorite states to hunt outside of your home state? Uh, Nebraska is probably my top state, uh, hands down. Uh, I think Nebraska is kind of a sleeper state. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of really good white tails out in Nebraska. And there's mule deer as well. There's antelope. I mean, it's a it's a kind of a, a neat tag. It's a relatively cheap tag, like 250 bucks over the counter, and it's an either or tag. So you can buy a you know if you buy an archery tag, you can buy a whitetail buck or a mule deer buck, either one. Um, so it's kind of a cool system, and you know they run their seasons a lot. Um, I guess really consistent to what Missouri is for the most part. The only cool thing about what they do is they open September 1st. So where Missouri opens September 15th, so I can go out and spend two weeks in Nebraska 
hunting before I can even, you know, I could ever hunt here in Missouri. There's that's a lot of like bonuses for for trying to calculate what's a good state. I mean that everything you just said for two hundred fifty bucks over the counter out of state tag for muley or whitetail. That's very inviting. Oh, absolutely. And there's giant mule deer. I mean, there's you know you're not going to kill what you could kill in Arizona or New Mexico, but you're also spending not even. I mean, a fifth of what the tag would cost, and it's the the counter tag. Right. Right. So, I mean, you're still going to be able to kill, you know, 170, 180, 190 mule deer out in the mm-hmm. sandhills um, for over the counter. So it's huge. And they have a ton of uh, a ton of public ground. That was my next question. So you, you, the, the tag is cool, but how, what's the access like? Is it so public, they, public they land? Have, yeah. There's a lot of access. I always hunt with outfitters out there. Um, just over the years of filming and stuff, I've met guys and kind of created relationships. Right. And, right. And we do some promotion with them, but um, there is a ton of public land out there. I know I've seen a bunch of it, and it's kind of um, it's kind of spread out. What it is is the state buys ground or, or pays farmers um, to turn ground into public ground, so essentially walking ground. Um, so it's kind of spread out, but they do really well with they create a map and and it's all online. I think even um, like on Onyx and some of those uh, apps, you can get on there and actually see where those areas are. And they're kind of spread out throughout the state. And it's just like anywhere else out here. Like the farther farther west you go, the less pressure you have. Mm. You know, it's like Kansas, same way. If you can get more than three hours from the border in Kansas, you're going to start seeing some a lot less pressure. And you know, the same thing goes for Nebraska. The farther west you go, the better it's going to be as far as you know dealing with people. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So how did you get interested in hunting in the first place? We're going to, I assume we're going to go back a ways. Did you, who introduced yeah, you to I, hunting? How, where, where does your passion come from? You know, it's a, that's a question I get a lot and I really, I don't have an answer for you. I, I always say, I joke about it, but it's kind of a curse. Um, ever since I was a kid, I mean, little, like six years old, I was running around the yard with a BB gun and, um, I, you know, growing up and going, you know, eight and 10 and 12, I, I kind of graduated to like a 22 and then going out in the timber and, and walking in the woods. And it's just what I would do when I got out of school, I'd go to school at three o'clock and I'd go out and I'd walk around till dark and come back. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't have that one person that's like, Hey, this guy really introduced me to hunting or took me hunting for the first time. Um, it was something that I had ingrained in me since I was a well, as a, you know, as I, as I can remember, I, uh, I don't know if it was just the adrenaline rush of being close. I mean, I have memories, you know, vague memories of when I was eight years old and I had a bow in my hand and was trying to shoot squirrels with field tips in the woods and I had a buck come by with a doe. He's rutting, you know, and I didn't know any of this at the time, but he was rutting and pushing her around. And I said, I stood really still and just stood by a tree and he ran her around me probably. I don't know, five or six different times and got out of there and it was like the coolest thing I can, I mean, I vaguely remember it, you know, but it was the coolest thing at that time I could ever do. And the deer was huge and looking back on it now, it was probably, you know, a hundred inch six pointers, but at that time it was like the right. coolest thing that happened, you know, and it kind of, kind of hooked me into it. Um, I mean, my dad always rifle hunted in Missouri, but, uh, and, you know, I, I say that I maybe don't give him enough credit. I mean, he was always um, he always promoted it. You know what I mean? He always tried to help me if I asked for help or it was like, hey, will you take me? He would always take me here and my grandpa. Um, but for the most part, the drive to do it was something that ever since I can remember, it was just the most important thing to go do and top priority in what I was doing. Gotcha. So you were kind of like the driving force behind it. You didn't necessarily have somebody saying, Hey, Hey kid, come, come with me. I want to show you what it's like outside. You were kind of like, I'm, yeah. I'm here. Let's go. Yeah. It was, it was a thing that we're like, I was, you know, waking up at, uh, you know, my dad jokes about even this day, but I was, I was waking up at, you know, daylight and I'd go in and ask him if he'd want, if he'd go squirrel hunting. He was like, no, I'm going to sleep in. And I'd just go. <laughs> like, right, it right. was just, you know, I, I don't know. I can't explain it. And it kind of followed me and just grew and grew and grew as I got older. And I was, you know, skipping practice at school, to, in high school to go hunting. And I was, you know, kind of losing girlfriends over it and not going out, you know, at night because I had to hunt. And it was just something that I just... Right. You know, just had to, I call it a curse, but it was just something I just had to do, you know, and it took priority over pretty much everything. Right, 
right? I I hear that a lot. Like you know, some some people get stuck in relationships and other activities, yeah. sports, whatever. But but that the hardcore hunters will abandon all of that on occasion to make sure that they're in the woods, and it's like this driving force. It's a call to the wild somehow. And yeah. you can't explain it. It's just this thing that makes you get out of bed in the morning and it's like, I got to do this. And I, I, I don't know, maybe it goes back to our genetics or, our, you know, as apex predators. And it's just like this thing we got to do. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's crazy, but it's, uh, it's been something that I think, you know, I've been in this industry now for, you know, I got to a point to where, and it's funny because, you know, my grandma and grandma and dad and all those people still joke about it to this day. Was, you know, when you were a kid, you said you were going to make a living hunting and we all told you you were crazy. Right. You can't make any money at that. You got to make your priorities right. You got to go, you know, you got to focus on school. You got to, you can't do this, can't do that. And, and it's, you know, that, that didn't drive me into it. I just knew at that point, like, it was just, like, you know, the best way to describe it is it's just a curse. It's just something that I just have to do, and I don't have an option. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. I, I I can go and, and work a full-time job and uh, make great money at it, and there's still a piece of me that wants to be there every day. You know, I just can't settle for that. So it, it's just something that worked out and I was blessed enough to have it, you know, work out to where I could make a living at it. Um, but also be able to do something that's just almost second nature and just something that, you know, you never feel like, I never feel like, man, I, I don't want to hunt today. Yeah. Or, you know what I'm saying? It's just, right. just a really cool calling that. So do you think to embrace as much as when people told you that you, you couldn't make a living doing this, was that a motivator or was that like, it, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to do this. It's not, it's not more of a motivator. It's just, I mean, obviously you hear those things when people tell you you can't, you kind of want to do it, but did you have a lot of that or, and were people, and was that a motivator of sorts? Uh, I, you know, I'm stubborn. I'm going to say that it was probably a little bit of both, okay. but at the time I don't, uh, I guess I understand what they're saying because nobody was making money at it at the time. There yeah. was nothing. There was there was Buckmaster TV, yep. and then you bought DVDs or VHSs if you wanted to watch hunting shows. I get there was just nobody doing it. Right. So you know I understand. I don't think it was about you know them being like oh you're not good enough, and I didn't take it as that way. It was just a matter of like nobody had ever done it, and you know at that time it was like. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to do it. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to go film television shows because nobody was doing it. Probably. I was just like, man, I was, I'm just, I got to figure out a way. Like, this is too much of a draw for me to not try to figure out a way to, you know, make some money at this and doing it. Whether it be guiding, whether it be, there has to be something I can find, you know, and that was kind of the right. search that just kind of started that way. Gotcha. <laughs> and so it's, it sounds like there were, there were just people that cared about you that didn't really look at or looked at the odds and said, Hey, the odds are against you. You might want to reconsider this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. What, um, how long have you been at this now? God, um, I'm going to say that I've been filming, uh, for television for, this will be the 12th year. Um, filming and just, just trying to really get stuff together for hunts. We only need to do that for another, I would say, um, man since i was probably 15 so 17 years 17 years um, all right so 18 years yeah gotcha so i mean this is <clears throat> this is uh that's a long time that's a career that's, yeah. you know that's that's when people start change jobs kind of thing sometimes right. Right, we'll finish this one up and, but i don't i don't feel like you're going anywhere anytime soon like i feel like you're in this thing no i don't have an option i mean <laughs> <laughs> for me it's just i i i don't you know it's something that i'm going to do as long as i'm physically able to do and and we try to grow and change as, you know, kind of the industry's come up. I've only done it um, full-time now for the last three years, two and a half, and and uh, part-time, you know, before that for, gosh, uh, I'd say, I think I've been in TV since 2010, so um, the last nine years. Um, you know, just kind of part-time doing it and just kind of built it up. I mean, when I started it, you know, when I was like, okay, we're going to go after this filming industry and, and try to do it that way, you know, I started, I was like, I just want to get a deal on on some of my product. That's what I want to do. I love what I'm doing, but I just want to get a deal on my stuff. I don't want to pay full price for it. Right. 
And then we started kind of getting that to roll, and I was like, okay, I don't, uh, how can I make it cheaper for myself? Because this is what I got to do. And it just kind of kept going, kept going, kept going. And it was like, okay, well, how can we make it pay for itself? Yep. And then it started doing that, and it was like, how do you make, you know, how do you get to make money? Just take it in steps, you know, and, and try to grow and, and grow slow, and you'll be around forever, you know, if you try to grow too fast, you'll. you'll Learn out quick and, and, you know, learned a ton over the years. And I tell you what, it, it's become kind of a thing to where, you know, nowadays you see guys doing it, you see guys get famous, you see guys, you know, fail, you see and all of it. And it's, it's something for me that's, I guess, kind of nice, I guess, to, to be able to fall back on that passion of it and the drive to have that to where I can really just stay centered. And I'm not in this thing to be famous. I'm not in this, you know, never been in this industry to be famous, never been in this industry to try to say I know everything about it. Um, just just get in this industry to be able to do what I love and, and to hopefully, you know, help educate people and kind of my mistakes, you know, as you can imagine when you start that young and no one really is there to guide you, you make a bazillion mistakes. And, and I've made a bazillion mistakes and still do to this day. I mean, that's just part of hunting, but you try to take it all and put it together and, you know, um, build a brand around just quality content with good information Mm -hmm. and not build a brand around who I am as a person or, you know what I mean? Kind of, I'm not in it, you know, I don't know if you check out like my Instagram page, there's a very, there's very few pictures of my face or me, what I would say, you know, showboating what I do on, on personal level of things, you know, it's just, I don't feel like that's what the followers really want. Um, I, you know, in my dream of kind of my business and my brand is, is a matter of quality content, good deer, but overall is good education and, and um, good information for people to see, you know. I, I have to say, I, ha- I did notice that about your page. Like, it's not a lot of you. It's a lot of, mm-hmm. like, deer and, and pictures that mm-hmm. y- you would hope to see. And, right. I, I mean, I, I get it. And I think some, uh, we're the same way. Like, we don't love to really show about ourselves. But if we have a successful something or if somebody else does, we'd love to share that. And right. It, but, the you know, the selfies and the, you know, the self-promotion not so right. it's not really our style and no it's just yes no not, not really your style either from what i can tell no that's not what i'm here for i mean i i uh for me it's just a matter of, of promoting you know the, what goes on out there and and really try to help it grow and you know maybe maybe someday you know get somebody into it that didn't really know or, or somebody's struggling you know i would love to have someone be able to provide information like I'm trying to provide when I was 15 years old. Right. You know what I mean? Or 12 years old. That's the way I look at it. Right. Your, uh, your Instagram page um, mm-hmm. reads the Blake Garrett. Right. Tell me about that. So, we, I mean, gosh, it kind of just, it, it, I give a lot of the credit, I guess, for the growth of it to um, my, you know, when I was really heavy with Full Drill Ventures um, on Sportsman Channel at that time. And, uh, building marketing stuff for it, and then just kind of built some good partners with Covert uh, Trail Cameras, started kind of doing stuff for them. So a lot of the following, I think, kind of, you know, I saw a big rise in it um, from starting to kind of work with Covert, Covert sharing my stuff, and, and then, you know, we had a couple um, pictures and videos, trail cam pictures and stuff go, go kind of viral and, you know, get 200,000 views on Instagram and stuff like that to where, you know, it just kind of helped. Um, build it, but then over, you know, over the time I've had it, it kind of started growing and growing and growing and growing, and I, it was just my personal page at the time, so I changed it over to a, um, I guess now they have it as a uh, personality page, and then they have a business page option. I had business page before, and just kind of started building it up, and you know, as it started kind of growing in followers, I was like, well, I, I'm gonna, I want to pull out more of my personal stuff and kind of start running it as more of a. Um, uh, as what the brand should be and, and so kind of made that transition probably three or four years ago um and when you know we developed an app um called unfiltered outdoors three years ago and when we did that we really wanted to push into that mobile network so started kind of building the following and, and just you know from then on try to try to do all the, the social media stuff to, to help grow organically as you can you know posting daily and trying to push quality content and 
it's it's somewhat easy to run that page just because it's what I do, you know, all the time. So it's it's I say it's not a personal page, but it pretty much is because that's you know what I'm doing daily. <laughs> right, right. It's just I just don't post a selfie in the start of the looks or um, things like that. But <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been fun. That makes sense. You, and I think. Cuz Strickland probably said this best, and and just listening to your story, you've been this seventeen years. It's been a while, and there's always this perception that you got lucky if you've been at this for a while. And he, the way he states it, is you're the twenty year overnight success, right? right? So you right. you've been grinding at this profession for quite a while, and right. it it you start slow, you don't expect much, and then. You some of it catches hold and you build on it and you build on it and you build on it. And 20 years later, you finally, finally making some money at this thing. And then everybody's right. like, wow, where did he come from? You know? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I yeah. see that in you. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I, I think, you know, I think a lot of that contributes back to not wanting, you know, I'm anti showboat and I'm, I'm going to say this and there's guys that, you know, whatever I do your thing. I'm not knocking anybody for what they do or how they build a brand, but, for me, it's just um, I'm not going to do anything that I'm not a, behind 100, percent you know, in my heart. And I think that the brand that you know I'm trying to uh, to to kind of go with is just a uh, is just true me. You know, I, I don't want it about kind of what Blake Garrett is as much as like say, you know, the quality content, quality products, stuff like that. Just build it there, and if I'm able to make a living at it and not be uh, not be famous because I'm not. Less than weights or running or you know <laughs> doing things about me, <laughs> right, and, right, then then right. I'm alright with that. Yeah, that that's the brand I want to do. You know, like I said, it kind of all goes back to that passion of I'm living like I'm as famous as I've as I ever want to be right now yep. because I'm able to do what I love and make money. Right. You know, what I mean, I just that's that's where it is, and I think like we talked about, you know, the yeah. water just gets so yeah. muddy with guys in the industry because it's just, there's, there's smoke and mirrors. There's guys who, you know, I, I don't know a lot of guys who grind. Like I have, I'm hunting seven states plus Missouri. I'll literally be gone. I was home four nights last year from September 1st to Thanksgiving, four nights total that I saw my thing, like saw my life. Wow. So <laughs> like, wow. it's just a grind and you just run and go and go and go and go. But you know, a lot of times, um, there aren't a lot of guys out there, I guess, that do that. There aren't a lot of guys that do it full time. You know, a lot of guys that are fresh to this industry, they don't realize that they think, like, hey, if you're on TV, you're just making boo two bucks. And 90% of the people in this industry have full time jobs outside this industry. Yeah. That's yep. what people don't realize, you know? So, yep. yeah, what, there's a lot of you know, keys to it. Do you, being away that, that long, how does it take its, I mean, it's like a job of anything, you know, and I, mm -hmm. it's probably relative to athletes that play professional sports where they're gone from their families for an extended period of time. Not quite that long, but I mean, that's a long time to be away from the family. Do you ever find that that takes uh, uh, its toll and weighs on the family life? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my wife is an absolute trooper. She, <laughs> she deals with it well, but she's very understanding in the fact that she knows that you know, what my giveaway is. And she knows that there's really only three months out of the year that I can capture content and, you know, get the things and get the opportunities I have ahead of me. So she understands that, you know, you go through <clears throat> three or four months of, of being gone and, and, you know, talking to me on FaceTime or whatever every night. Um, but, you know, that the benefits are I'm home in the summer. And I'm home all the time in the summer, you know. So and she like this time of the year it's pretty much if she says, Hey, we're going to Menards to go shop and then guess what? We're going to Menards to go shop <laughs> and she right. she has me for the summer, you know. So it's a it's a trade off. But uh you know, I, I was funny, I, I talked to a guy the other day about it and he was like, Man, I don't know how you know how your wife deals with that. Well, she understands it and just like you said, you know, it's a it's a job and that's what it is and the difference between what I do and what you know, a lot of other guys do the arm industry is a lot of guys hunt for themselves and hunt for fun to hunt when they're not working. And if they don't kill anything, it's all right. But for me, I can go in and put in a full day's work um, for a year and bust my butt and do everything right I can do. And that deer still doesn't show up and I don't get paid essentially. 
<laughs> you know gotcha. what I mean? So, right, right, right. So it's it's a really a thing about opportunity and being and just spend as much time as you can in the woods for me. Because um, every time you're not in the woods in the fall, you have this little voice in the back of your head saying you may be missing an opportunity because right. you decided to take the day off, kind of thing. Right. When did uh, Full Draw Adventures come into your life? So I'll kick back. I, I started in the industry with a, a show called Campfire Stories. Okay. And the way I started with them was like I was talking about, you know, we had been filming um, and I just burned a, this is what I you when it was, I burned a DVD of our hunt and I took it to the Iowa Deer Classic and met Indy Wikers who owned uh, Campfire Stories at that time. They were going to the Pursuit Channel that year. And I gave him my hunts, said, hey, check these out. Would like to be a part of your show, whatever. Um, he called me back and was like, hey, man, love it. Uh, we're going to bring you on. Just be a pro staff guy. Um, we'll get you some product and stuff like that. And just start hunting. So I started with them. And, and really, from there, it just kind of snowballed. I mean, hunted with them for like three years, I think, three or four. And uh, started meeting sponsors that with them and, and just kind of rubbing elbows with guys. And then uh, we decided that we wanted to go to the Sportsman's Channel. Mm-hmm. Well, Campfire was staying on pursuit. So I kind of did the same thing where I took some hunts, put them together, got a hold of Bill um, at Full Drill and said, hey, this is you know kind of what we've done in the past. Um, looking to do some more. So went on there as, a, as just a pro staff and started a pro staff and with him for a year or two. Um, Kind of the same thing, met some sponsors with them, and met him, you know, just kind of got in a little with them. And then I, at that point in my career, it kind of started where I could bring some sponsors to the table. I, I had some guys I knew that, you know, saw some benefit in what kind of return they were getting out of me and stuff like that. So started bringing sponsors to Full Drill and really started working marketing for them as well. Um, stay with them all the way through until we developed the app. Um, I'm still technically with Full Trail Avengers. I still, you know, give them some uh, some video content a year, um, pretty much anything they want as far as bow kills go. Um, still helping a little bit with sponsors, but I, it's gotta, I gotta be careful with it because we have sponsors for the app as well, and I just don't want the money that water. So, right. kind of a, you know, um, kind of a working relationship with us, but we've partnered with Full Trail now to be on the app as well. So we've kind of married those two together where I think we can keep that relationship going um, in business sense for, for years to come. I don't think it'll be a thing to me. Okay. So you have you kind of have your own separate thing going, but you have a relationship with Full Draw. Yeah, I don't do, I, like I said, I don't do like full-scale marketing for them anymore. I yep. uh, used to. But yeah, I do kind of, we have unfiltered out those pages. And um, that's my myself and then John Dittmer. Uh, is my business partner and came from Jury's Good Dream Season and did My Till Fix um, and then left them whenever we came together and divided this app. So, um, yeah, we're kind of, kind of a hat. I mean, I'm wearing many hats, you know. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. We the full gel hat, we the unfiltered hat. Gotcha. Let's take a little break, and when we come back, we'll pick up where we left off with Blake Garrett. Rackology Deer Supplement and Attractant, developed through years of intense scientific research, comes a product that puts it all in one bag. Superior Attractant, scientifically formulated vitamins and minerals, and all at a much better price. To get yours today, please check out rackology.org for a list of dealers. Rackology, how can you afford not to use it? Everything deer need, all in one bag. And now back to our conversation with Blake Garrett. Gotcha. So, I mean, 17 years, you've been hunting since you were a kid with a BB gun. You had to pick up some strategies and techniques over the years that we could maybe help some other people out to make their hunting a little more successful. Yeah, Um, I mean, yeah. Tell me about some of the things that pop into your head that you think make you a better hunter. You know, I think I'm kind of cursed again, I'm going to say, with the OCD. So I, I pay attention to everything that I see going on in the woods. I pay attention to trail camera pictures. I pay attention to what I do in the woods. I and mean, all those things are, are analyzed at a, I guess, a, a really high level. In my brain. Um, I try to be, you know, I try to learn just as much as I think I know going into it and into every year. Um, biggest thing, I guess, I can say that, you know, we've picked up over the years is a uh, just kind of a deer movement pattern thing called the filter phase. Is the thing that I'm working on getting my article out on right now. I posted a little bit about it on my uh, Instagram page, but really it's a matter of, of uh, 
for many shower cameras, you figured out that bucks have been showing up and changing their areas um, from about July 25th to August 2nd. Mm. Every year in that same time frame, literally have, we have some bucks that showed up on a farm, I'll say once this week, like I showed up on the same mineral lake, on the same farm, within a day of each other, three years in a row. Hmm. Um, and he disappears again, and I don't pick him up until October. But he does it, he always shows up the last week, and he showed up the 30th, the 31st, and the 1st, the last three years. Um, that's of July and then August. And then I only get, you know, one set of pictures of him at that mineral lake, and then he's gone again, and he won't show back up until October. And it's a it's a really weird phase, but we've documented now 24 uh, bucks total in the last three years on six different pieces of property that have what we call field tripped the last week of July, first week of August, onto the property. They show up for a day, maybe two, and then they're gone again, and we don't pick them back up until the rut. And the bucks that we've had on those properties that we follow all summer and they leave that week, those bucks leave that farm as soon as they go harvesting. So I never get another picture of them until late season when they've either shed or about to shed their antlers. So we kind of picked that up. So I always tell guys, like, the biggest thing for the most important week to have your trail cameras out is always the last week of July, first week of August, because you're going to pick up some new deer that you're never going to see, but you're going to pick up the deer you're going to hunt during the rut. Um, gotcha. So it's kind of a new thing that really nobody, there's no information out on it. Like, no one's ever come up with it. No one's ever really noticed it. No one's ever seen anything with it. Um, worked with a couple of biologists about it. Um, biggest thing for them is, you know, what I'm getting back from them is that that week is the right amount of daylight hours where the bucks get their first shot of testosterone uh, uh, for the year. Ah, okay. So that first shot of testosterone pushes them out into their rut ranges. But they immediately come right back into their summer range, continue there, and when they get their next shot of testosterone, which is when they shed their velvet, that's when they push out to their rut range. And then from then on, the testosterone's rising, you know, all, all fall. So they stay in that rut range from that period on. That's interesting. So um, they're, they're like getting based off of um, biology and uh, the amount of daylight hours. So you're saying it's almost like going to the doctor and getting a shot of testosterone and get you up and going for a few days. Yeah. I mean, they feel almost like, you know, how we can, you know, just like you talked about with the, the cold nights and, you know, this time of the year, you start to kind of feel it. Mm-hmm. I think those bucks just start to kind of feel it. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, okay. Right. Summer's out. I got the right thing. But the biggest thing for me, and I guess that this is just the piece of the iceberg, but the biggest thing for me that I want to work on in the next you know, five years is, is if that's true and if there's, you know, I'm working with a radio collar. Missouri's doing a really big radio collar survey right now, and they should drop the data on it in two years. It's five for studying in year three now. Um, but if I can feel a spike there, what I've what I'm on to, I guess what I'm looking for is if as daylight hours are moving those bucks within a day each year of each other, then that tells you a lot about the estrus cycle. You know, if this one doe, say you have a doe on your farm and she comes in the, she comes in the heat October 31st every year, right? Because of the daylight hours, if there's correlation there, then you can almost tell, you know, when you need to be hunting your farms as far as those early does coming in the cycle. Right. To where you're going to have heightened activity. So we're just trying to find correlations with with daylight hours and deer movement. Um, It's almost like turkeys nesting. You know, there's a thousand different um, theories out there of why turkeys nest when they nest. You know, the ground temperatures got to be warm enough, whatever the case may be. And it's kind of find out it's a a biological thing of of daylight hours. I have a guy who who has a turkey farm for Tyson. And his lights messed up, and his lights stayed on too long, and he had that all of his turkeys started laying eggs in January, right? Because they had so much daylight hours. So you know, there's I think there's correlation there, and that's something that you know for the guys who are really trying to analyze the deer and figure out deer movement and trying to figure out when to take that vacation each year. I mean, there's things there that you can look at that um, you know you can say, hey, peak rut in Missouri is November 9th. Yeah, it is, but if you have an older doe structure on your farm. As old those breed first, and they usually come in sometime around the first to the fourth. Gotcha. That's a big correlation there. But I'm going to say my biggest, I guess, like I don't trim it there, but my biggest, um, I think the thing that's led to my success is lack of pressure that I bring on deer. We really start from the outside and work in on them, um, hmm. just trying to find a deer, figure out where he is, and really hunt edges for the most part. And just, just hunt the edges until you absolutely. You know, you're not being successful with it, and then you push back in and 
on on even them forty yards. And there, that when you, doesn't work. When you say edges, describe edges a little bit more. So for us in Missouri, um, we have we have quite a bit of open ground, not a lot, but you know, there's to see a a two hundred acre patch of timber is well, rare. Right. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, you're hunting 50 acre, 20 acre, 10 acre little patches of timber. Um, this time of year, it's not too big of a deer, too big of a deal because our deer are living in the corn for the most part, they're staying in corn, but they will move once that corn gets harvested and they'll move into the timber. So keeping those little sanctuaries and those areas that you don't pressure um, will hold your deer on your farm and they become more important. So when we talk about, you know, I'm really big on a supplemental feeding plan uh, that's something that we've we've gotten really deep into the last two years and it's something that we're seeing just ridiculous results out of um so we, you know we try to set up that feeding plan on the edges we try to set up cameras on the edges of that timber and we really hunt on the edge of that timber early until the rut and then when the rut happens if we haven't capitalized by hunting our edges we'll push into the timber and hunt the funnels and things like that in, you know in november but um, gotcha. found a lot of success from that, from hunting on those edges like that. For you know, you're looking for scrapes, you're hunting field edges, things like that. Okay, the so the edges of the field where the timber meets the, the egg or whatever it is, correct transitional yep. zones. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right, and you mentioned that, the, and I know you have a relationship with Covert. We also have a relationship with Covert, but I do mm-hmm. really like Covert. Like I, I went after the the camera company because I thought there was a good relationship that could be formed there. And I really liked their product. Right. And one of the things that I think is one of the most useful tools, and I don't know if you're using it now, but are, are some of the cell cam stuff. Mm-hmm. Are, oh, you, absolutely. are you using some of the cell cam technology? Yeah. I am. Yeah. I've got a couple of E1s now, yep. and then I've got, I've got two or three of the older ones of black ops, um, still running too. Okay. What, and I like them, yeah. Do you find that they're a bigger advantage to stay out of the woods more, or it, in your strategy, it doesn't really matter? I think, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, they're nice for me because they kind of scratch an inch of me wanting to check my show cameras. <laughs> so I can, I can let them sit a little bit longer. Right. But I utilize them for a lot of things. I utilize them um, not only for security on the farms as well, but... Um, I'll utilize them to check my feed levels to see when feeders get empty, when feed gets, you know, is gone. Um, and usually I have to run them on edges where I'm at in Missouri just because cell phone signal down in the ditches and down in the timber yep. isn't great anyway. Um, but I could push it into if I wanted to, but I think kind of with my strategy, they set out a lot of times I have, like on a feed site for some, for instance, I'll have two cameras, running where I'll have a, a basic um, covert camera and then I'll have a cell camera there. And this is kind of a nice way for me to keep tabs on what's what's using it. And like I said, the feed levels of, you know, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to have to drive in there every week and check and see how much corn I got on my ground and how much big time I got on the ground to see if it needs to be refilled or not or whatever. Um, it's just a way to I'd say, okay, hey, they're out of feed. I need to go feed today, you know, kind of thing. Right. Um, but there's a ton of different ways. I mean, Josh, you're absolutely right. You can get it into an area, um, you know, in the rut and tell a deer in there on a seat. If you have the option to get in there and hunt in them, get in there and hunt in kind of thing. Right. Right. Gotcha. What else, uh, have you picked up over the years as far as like, uh, so you've got a few strategies that you use, but getting in and out of the sites, um, you know, you've you've got certain scouting techniques. You've got certain um, scent cover techniques. Uh, mm-hmm. Making yourself neutral, making yourself smell like something. Making um, the time of day you go in. Do you have any like? Uh, are there any rules that you follow? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we you know we try to make ourselves as predictable as possible to the deer um, all year long. I mean, when we feed, um, I feed out of, out of my truck. I check all my cameras are within. 30 yards of where I can drive to. So we'll drive into a farm and drive right to the camera, drive right to the feed sites, dump everything, be loud. I mean, just do what we do. We always feed in the middle of the day, never go early, never before nine o'clock and never after five uh, this time of the year. And um, really just try to let the deer kind of pattern us. And we found out that over the years, like deer, it's not necessarily pressure as far as you being on your farm. 
as much as it's like unexpected pressure for them. So, you know, the, we want to be able to be predictable and we want them to be able to watch us drive in and feed and drive right back out and not stand up and not, you know, run off the farm and, and things like that. So we try to have kind of a positive influence anytime we have interaction in the timber. So, you know, we'll take, I'll even take like a pound of mineral. And every time I go to a mineral site to pull a camera, I'll put a little bit of mineral down. Or, you know, we always dump a little bit of feed when we pull a camera or things like that. Just just positive interactions for the most part through the year. <clears throat> and I think if you do that and you're able to capitalize whenever you do push the pressure, right? Like if I move a stand back 40 yards and then hunt it that day and have that buck come through and I'm killing it. None of the herd knows that there's pressure there. Do you know what I'm saying? Right, right. Um, we really try to minimize it like that. We also don't do does on the farm. Um, it's very rare if we do shoot a doe, and if we do, we're going to shoot a doe that's alone. Um, a lot of guys, I think, make the pressure or make the problem of shooting does, and they'll shoot a doe with four other does in the field with her. And all you did is educate those does that, A, hunters are bad, you know, humans are bad, the fence bad, and whatever blind or sand or whatever you shot them out of is a bad thing for them, and there's danger there. So we're really, really selective about where we take those and uh, what those we take as far as, you know, we want singles and and, uh, and try not to educate the deer herd for the most part on pressure. That thing. Gotcha. So you're, you're very conscientious about educating other deer by making a solo interaction or mm-hmm. if you're going to have interaction in their area that, and taking that, that negative pressure oriented scenario and doing something that turns it into a positive interaction, like a little bit of feed, a little bit of mineral, something that makes them think that and feel that, okay, well, this new stands here. Um, and, but there's food there. So that must be a good thing. So Yeah. I mean, I think it's a matter of, and like I said, I go back to my OCD thing of, it's a matter of, I think they, you know, if they smell me, at the feed site all year long. And then I go in and I hang a tree stand and I dump two pounds of big pine on the ground below it, that they're going to think I'll just have another feed site there. And they're not going to have any more question and kind of why I was in there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it's more of a, uh, you know, I look at it as like, I look at cattle and I, when I was in high school, I was a, cow, a farm hand. We had cows that literally you could pull up. And if, if you were in a white truck and you pulled the top of the hill and honked the horn, they would all come to you. But if you pulled up and you're in a black truck and you honk the horn, none of them would come. <laughs> like, right. you don't realize, like, it's just little things that they see that they just automatically associate with. Wait a second, that's a positive thing. You know, this is going on. I, and that's what we try to do with them is just try to be as positive interaction as we can. You know, I hate shed season. I absolutely hate it because I have to walk my farm right. to, you know, in areas that I don't walk in all year long. And we blow all the deer out. But what we found is a lot of times I'll just go, you know, 50 yards around us and go right back in. But it's a it's a thing about, you know, just minimizing pressure on the farm and trying to be as predictable as we can for us going in there. Because unfortunately, and, and especially in my business, I have to pull cameras. I have to run a bunch of cameras. I have to feed a bunch of feed. You know, all those things are things I have to go into, which uh, have me going in and out of the farm more than what normal people could. A lot of guys won't even touch their farm. I know a lot of the old school guys that, you know, hunt giant deer won't even touch the farm until November. Literally won't go into it at all. And that's great. But in the industry I'm in, I got to get trail camera pictures. And I just want to follow bucks. I want to know bucks. I want to, you know, be able to follow the herd and see what's going on with it. So kind of found a way to, to turn our pressure of going into that farm into a positive interaction with the deer and we found out that it makes, I mean, leaps and bounds. We've had deer, I've had deer, like, we hung a stand. We, you know, we quit feeding that at one spot specifically and uh, went in probably a month later. And I went in to hang a stand and went in kind of by the feeder. And I parked my truck right by where the feeder was and went and found a tree and went up the tree. And I was up the tree, got the sticks up there. I was getting ready to pull the first stand up. And here comes six deer running across the field to the feeder. And they come right underneath me, go right where the feeder was, smell around, smell with my truck, walk around it a bunch, and then they just push off into the timber. Never like boogered one time. Hmm. But it was just a matter of they saw me kept driving, and they knew that my truck comes in here and goes there. There's food there. And they, had, they hadn't had food for a month. So gotcha. they thought, 
it's on, you know, yeah. <laughs> come running all, all the way in to get it, you right. know, 10 minutes after I got there and there was no people. But that's the kind of thing, you know, you kind of want to rewire the brain and to, to see positive things with you. And, right. You know, guys will, a lot of times guys, will, you know, will, will take a four wheeler into their farm when they don't usually use a four wheeler or they'll, you know, they'll take the truck and heaven forbid they shoot from the truck or shoot from the four wheeler or even jump, you know, jump off the four wheeler and shoot. Well, when that deer hears a four wheeler from now on, the deer understands that there's danger involved in it. You know what I mean? That's just, yeah. there's science and biology right. to prove that animals like that thing. You know, they learn from native experiences. So, um, you know, it kind of all came back from when we started rattling and calling bucks in. You know, we'd, we'd rattle a buck one time. But if he got around and got a wind, he'd never held that buck in the rest of the year. Yeah. So it shows retention in their brain for da- you know for right. danger. Right. Yeah. It's simple. It's simple math, really, to them, and it's it's conditioning, and it's yeah. simple conditioning. But you got to know that it's it is occurring because all they know is survival, right? Right. Yeah. And and if you trigger one of those brain cells to store a negative interaction that could potentially influence their survival or lack of survival, then you know that that condition is off the plate. Like you can't do that again. Right. You won't get away with it. Yep. Very interesting that you, that you're paying that much attention to conditioning of the interactions specifically, if you're aware of certain deer in the area and that you're teaching yeah. them. Um, it's not like they're sitting down and philosophizing, you know, right. stuff, but, <laughs> but they certainly know a yes or a no or a danger or no danger kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you got to think about it. Someone's been trying to kill them since the day they were born. Right, right. Always. Right. So they have to learn quick. And the ones that learn, you know, the ones that learn quick are the hardest ones to kill. Right, right. And that's, those are the ones you're going after, you know. So it's, there's a whole thing with it. And that's why I always, you know, revert back to being OCD about it. But we really, really pay attention to that stuff and really try to, you know, stay stay disciplined on that stuff because yep. you will see great benefits out of it if you can do it. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Let's, uh, if you could, entertain us with a memorable deer hunt that you've been on, uh, something that kind of makes a lot of sense and incorporates a lot of the things that you use in the woods, maybe highlights yeah. some of your strategies. You know, I'm going to say ooh, um, maybe four years ago, um, I had picked up this little bitty 30-acre piece of ground, and it wasn't much. It probably had five acres of timber on it, and that was it. And it was within... The timber was within 200 yards of the road. Mm. So, you know, looking at the property, you wouldn't think much of it. But I knew that the surrounding property and kind of what it connected was good. And I thought, man, i get it and see. I mean, maybe in the rut, you know, we'll have some deer swinging through it. Um, started running cameras on it <clears throat> and ran cameras all summer. Never even picked up a horn buck. Never, I mean, nothing. Just a bunch of does and earlings. And... About September 15th, September 20th, rolled around. And I went in and um, pulled a card, and all of a sudden I had like five different bucks on it two shooters and um, a bunch of younger, three year old women. And the only thing that changed is the crops had come out to the west of it. So they had harvested the standing corn. So those bucks, like we talked about, those bucks put in the standing corn in summer here, they do at least. Um, so as soon as that corn's gone, they have to suck in this timber. Mm. So they moved in this timber, and I'd only literally I looked at it on Google Earth, and the bigger chunk of the timber kind of bottleneck, and the bigger chunk of the timber I'd never even walked in. I, it's like still to this day, I've never walked in it. Um, I walked in maybe, oh, I'd say 50 yards from the edge and found a tree that's right in the middle of uh, the bottleneck, put a stand there, and left it. Just thought, you know, we'd we'll run a camera and see what happens. Well, we had a buck show up, <clears throat> really a big eight pointer, had two giant eye guards, and <clears throat> he had showed up on the camera five days in a row in the daylight. Okay. We're like, okay, yeah, this is game on. Well, he was living in the larger part of the bottleneck on the third at the time. So I had I had to have a north wind to hunt it. Now you're talking late September at this point, which north winds aren't new since <laughs> that time of the year. Um, it's, I had, I had like, Four days I had to wait until I got a cold front. Wow. And, okay. Yeah. So I, I have to sit down of it for four days. So I left it. I got out of the farm, waited, had a cold front that went from maybe 
62 and went down to 60 at 60 or 59 degrees as a high that next day so okay. when that cold front came through so the cold front came through when it did it pushed rain that morning um so i waited till the evening went in got in the tree um had a three-year-old deer come by us that was a great deer like a mid 30s buck and probably 11 or 12 does mm. came by and uh, we're sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and then all of a sudden this deer shows up right behind us, comes right underneath us, and I end up shooting him like five yards from the tree. Mm. And uh, gun killed, you know, he runs 150 yards and we're getting wrapped up and all that. And it was really the first time that I'd ever kind of utilized everything as far as minimized places with trail camera, you know, viewing him on trail camera and kind of figuring him out on trail camera for when he was there and then also adapting to waiting for the cold front to get in there and hunt him. Um, it just kind of all came together for the first hunt of the year in Missouri being, it was like October 6th, I think, or something. Um, you know, season had been open almost a month, but we hadn't had a cold front yep. and we just kind of sat back and wait for it and minimize pressure on 30 acres to kill these 152 inch eight pointer. Um, just a super, super cool thing that where everything worked out, you know, in the end. And it was kind of nice to see it all kind of utilize, you know, three or four different pieces together to get that dude killed. Right. Right. That's very cool. Very cool. Let me uh, yeah. run 10 rapid fire questions by you, if I could. Okay. <laughs> right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Number one hunting tip of all time is... I'm going to say, I don't want to say minimize pressure because it's just too broad. Right. I'm going to say shoot what, you, what you're what you happy with, not what you think someone else is happy That's with. That's a good one. Yep. Yeah. I like that one. Um, we have these things, or some of us have these things, that if we are in a tree stand, we realize we forgot it in the truck or at home. It drives us insane. Um, what's that one thing for you? My binos. Binos, definitely. Um, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Uh not having confidence in the person that you are. I like that one. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Confidence, when I find somebody that's not confident in who they are, it drives, it makes me crazy. Like, I just don't, I don't know. I can't yeah, see. and the sad thing is a lot of them have a lot to offer. Absolutely. If there's somebody like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, yes. that's the, that's the, I get, I would say disappointing. That's the disappointing part to me. Yep. I, I know what you're saying. What, how old are you today? I'm 35. You're 35. What would you tell a 17 year old? Blake Garrett, knowing what you know about life. Ah, uh, take your time. <laughs> nice. Don't rush it. Yep, I like it. All right, you you're at a hotel and at a hunting convention somewhere in the country, and they you meet a stranger in the lobby. They ask you what you do for a living. What would you tell them? I create uh, marketing content for the outdoor industry. Nice. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I ate a waffle. A waffle. All right. Yeah. You can have your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas, so you can put anything you want on it. What would you put on it? Uh, I would probably, probably put uh, an ad for Unfiltered Outdoors, the app, <laughs> to download. <laughs> Smart. Smart businessman. I like it. <laughs> if I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Successful? Probably my grandpa. Okay. Um and he was successful on, on a lot of different levels, but um, uh, just the family core aspect of, you know, he, he made a lasting legend and he made impressions on people that they live with today. And I feel like that's success. Gotcha. Very cool. What's a typical day in your life look like? This time of year, it's a lot of emails and uh, phone calls. And then if I can skirt away, it's shoot the bow and trail cameras. Gotcha. All right. And then what's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? Start, uh, start to finish. It's long and stressful for me. All right. Um, overanalyzing everything, probably. <laughs> does it does it start early and end late? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll hunt. I mean, we grind, so we'll hunt till shoot. Early season, we usually don't hunt a lot of mornings, but yeah. I mean, we'll still go out at three and, and hunt till, till dark and it's try to get out there well before anything's moving and, and out there after everything's kind of gone by. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Those are the 10 rapid fire questions. You did nice. well. You did good. well. Yep. Sometimes we create more questions than answers here on the show when we go through a podcast. Where are some good places to find you? So, yeah, you can shoot an email just Blake Unfiltered Outdoors at gmail.com or on my Instagram page at the Blake Garrett on Instagram. Very cool, man. 
Blake, I got to say, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I learned a bunch about the things you use to be successful in the woods. And I hopefully, and hopefully we'll find that there are people that are listening. will pick up on a few of those things and add them to your, their bags, bag of tricks and make them more successful this year. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And anytime, let me know if you want to jump on another one or if anybody ever has any questions, feel free to shoot them. I have a ton of questions on Instagram. I get daily and I try to get to all of them. It may be late at night, but try to help out where I can. Well, I do appreciate Blake coming on the show and kind of expressing to us how he goes about his day when it comes to deer hunting. He certainly has um, focused on those positive deer reinforcement events as opposed to the negative, endlessly avoiding those negative deer interactions. And I think it's very interesting that he is able to take more of a global look with his, with his game cameras and really take a hard look at what's happening with deer year over year as opposed to what's happening right now. And I think that might be one of those key indicators that we haven't really thought about yet. But the, and we've heard this on the show before, where where some deer seem to show up at a certain point, but I haven't heard that it the the activity that occurs in July and August is necessarily the activity that's going to sh- show up early season or just when the the antlers are starting to shed. But I'm uh, I'm very interested to find out where these theories go with some radio collar technology. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, Facebook.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry. We're also on Twitter, which is Twitter.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry. We are also on Instagram, Instagram.com forward slash BigBuckRegistry, and YouTube, which is YouTube.com forward slash big buck registry on youtube you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety as far as videos are concerned it's a boring video but the audio content is there so you can actually listen to our podcast you can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on thursday nights when we do do them and we've gone back and interviewed re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice let's put it that way you can always listen to our show on other places as well not just youtube we're found on stitcher tune in radio iheart radio spotify google play and as an amazon alexa skill go to alexa and say alexa enable big buck registry and if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans. All you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.